Influence Continuum. This is a podcast all about influence, not just destructive influence like the ones we see in cults, but also the ethical, healthy side of influence. I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan, and I'm delighted to have my friend Christian Zerko and colleague, uh, uh, an American who moved to England many, many years ago. And he is, is one of those small number of colleagues around the world who have been helping people out of destructive cults and controlling relationships longer than I have. And Christian, um, you know, you're, you're part of Dialogue Center UK. It's a Christian non-denominational uh, uh, organization, a charity for decades. And you are helping people who asked for your help, basically. And I, I asked you to please come on the Influence Continuum with me and share your knowledge and wisdom because you have a different approach than mine, as it should. Uh, but I also imagine we have a lot of uh, dovetailing of our approaches because when you do it as many decades as we both have been doing it, yes. you keep learning and improving. Oh, yes. Uh, is that oh, right? Yes. I, I feel like I have learned so much. Is that correct? Yeah. And I learned I, much much of what I've learned. I've learned from clients. So tell us. Um, Sorry. I think we're having a lag problem here. Yes, that's exactly right. I'll I'll be patient. Uh, it's an uh, maybe an internet problem, but we can cut this little piece out. Um, so, Christian, would you just tell our listeners about you? How did you get interested in cults and mind control? And just walk us through some of the pivotal stepping stones for you to, that's helped you get to this point of expertise. It was entirely by accident. I uh, I came out of uh, my adolescence really uh, was about meditation, and yoga. Um, I was involved in several different groups along the way. I moved through Hinduism into Zen and into some other things. And eventually I left that because it was damaging me. Um, one of the things I discovered was that although intellectually I kept growing, I kept learning, I kept you know, studying, doing all that kind of thing. But emotionally, I became more and more frozen. Uh, and eventually, I had to do something about it. I left meditation behind, left the, the whole practice that I was involved in behind. Uh, it was around that time I became a Christian as well. But um, I found myself in the situation where I was talking to people I knew who were also having trouble and they didn't know who to talk to because the people they talked to became maybe confrontational or critical uh, in very overt ways. And they just felt like mm -hmm. they couldn't talk to anyone and they felt they could talk to me. So I, for example, the very first conversation I had, I was working in a, in a, in a cinema actually in Los Angeles at the time. And one of my work colleagues came over to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was really the beginning of it. And somehow I managed to apply what I understood wow. to his problem and it helped. And along the way, more and more people started coming. He, I guess he told mm -hmm. somebody and they told somebody. And I just found I've got something that they want. It's helping them. So I kept doing that. Eventually I got involved. I thought I was going to leave it behind. You know, you know how it is, Steve, you get to a point where you think, other people should be doing this, not me. So I tried to move on. And uh, what should happen? But I was asked if I would be the counselor for ex-members and for people who were struggling at our church, at the church I was attending. 
And that was really the beginning. And that was 1973. They just said, mm -hmm. well, you know, you seem to understand this stuff. We don't want to mess with it because we're going to do it wrong. So they gave that job to me. I began, yeah. So tell us about your sources of influence. Um, well, there again, I was, I guess you could say I was apprenticed, or we would now say interned to a pastoral counselor who um, had certain guidelines mm -hmm. that he laid down very early on. There are things you don't do. There are things you avoid doing. There are things you watch out for. And he was very instructive in my life and very helpful in that way. I also I started talking with a psychologist who was a little interested in some of this, wasn't quite sure what was going on. And he was, I guess you could say he was picking my brains about what I was experiencing and what I had done so that he could inform himself on how to, to function. But he was also giving me advice and giving me the benefit of his training and knowledge. And uh, that kept, that just kept developing as I met more people. And then I came to this country in 1976, mm -hmm. thinking I'd left this all behind for good. This is it. I'm done. And the first thing that happens is I ended up involved at the at a university in Manchester um, where they were having problems with, of all things, the Unification Church, a group you know something about. Your own. My old yes, cult. Yes. Stalking. Yes. And so there I was and trying to help with with what was going on there. And again, I found myself involved in, well, there were two different organizations, including a parent support group here, and a very early ex-member support group, which is now, as far as I know, defunct. I haven't heard of them in years. Mm -hmm. And so it just it just developed from there. And then in 1984, I got involved with the Dialogue Center. Uh -huh. And that's, you know, uh, along the way, I was also working in conjunction with a very, uh, skilled psychiatrist in this country who had in fact been connected to William Sargent. She'd studied with William Sargent in her earlier days. And so she was interested in all of this. What's, Betty What's Tilden, her name? She's dead now, unfortunately. She was an Oh, I remember. <laughs> yeah, I she's remember. She's an amazing Betty. woman. I've... And she amazing worked woman. together for many years. Yes. And in fact, she was the one that got me involved in yep. sort of the she, she encouraged me because in the 70s, I didn't see a lot of emphasis on recovery. I saw a lot of emphasis on get people out of the group, not a lot of emphasis mm -hmm. on what happens after they're out of the group. And that bothered me. I didn't think that was right. I knew for me it had, hadn't worked. Yep. And so my emphasis, wanted I wanted to be emphasizing recovery. And the problem was that nobody else really mm -hmm. was looking at it back in the, the 70s and even into the 80s. And Betty was the first one who said, focus on that. That's what needs to be done. And so we developed together a lot of working um, mm -hmm. practices that we used to employ. We used to work with each other sometimes. And she taught me bags of things about stuff that I had no mm -hmm. idea about. So um, I'm very grateful to her forever. She is mm -hmm. one of those people we, you know, we've benefited from in this country. I think she was our Margaret Singer. Great. So, um, yeah, I think so. Of course, Margaret was a psychologist and Betty was yeah. a psychiatrist, which is yes. a medical doctor. But nevertheless, there are very too few people uh, with her training and background that were willing to roll up their sleeves yeah. and say, there's a real problem here. And what do we need to do to help others? So is it fair to say that you, um, uh, because it's a Christian non-denominational organization, that you will talk to anyone, even if they're an atheist or a I Jew have no, or a Hindu? We have no Buddhist, concern correct? about that. The, the thing about being Christian is that, A, it means that I pay attention to people's spiritual concerns. Um, a lot of people who approach this strictly from secular point of view, not everybody, but a lot of people, when the, when the client says, well, mm -hmm. you know, I, it, it's because I'm religious or because I have a spiritual interest or something like that, and their attitude is to switch the subject, they don't want to talk about it, either because they don't feel competent or because they maybe feel it's irrelevant. For me, if you're hungry, 
I'll talk about healthy ways of doing that if that's what you still want. If you say, I'm done with religion, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. the, the being Christian part is about the rules I apply to myself not the rules I apply to other people. So anybody comes, mm -hmm. I've had Jewish clients, I've had Hindu clients, Buddhist clients, atheist clients, it doesn't matter. What matters is that I treat them in the appropriate way. Right, so I wanna make a, so I wanna just spell mm -hmm. out for our listeners that there are people, Jewish, Christian, etc., that believe it's their mission to save cult members, to get them into the truth, their version of the truth. And I consider exactly. that unethical. Exactly. And I assume you it's do not as my well. Job. I mean, if somebody came to your house to fix your stereo, you wouldn't expect them to give you a religious talk. You would expect them to fix your stereo. If you went to your doctor, you expect them to help you with your health. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the same thing. People come to me in good faith, expecting me to help them not expecting me to do something to them with a hidden agenda. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. So on the one hand, I'm upfront with people. Yes, right. I am I am right. a Christian myself, but that's about me holding myself to the highest mm -hmm. standards that I can. That's not about me imposing something on someone else. Yep. And I think you understand a little bit about that. Yeah, this is a very important exactly. ethical a very important ethical thing. I went the mm -hmm. traditional route um, to become a mental health professional and jump through all the the hoops yeah. of licensing and all credentialing. And I was taught never to share your personal mm -hmm. stuff with your clients. It should be focused yes. on them. And after a few years, I realized this was bad mm -hmm. advice to me that it, by not sharing my Mooney experience with with people coming out of cults, I was depriving them of real knowledge that might apply to them, but also an opportunity for them to identify that I'm I'm a fellow yeah. traveler, that I'm not just you know sitting behind the desk, you know, uh, and 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 taking that perspective. And likewise, I was taught to keep your your own personal beliefs out of it because of the power imbalance. Exactly. You're the counselor. Keep keep your faith out of it, but I found as I grew up and I learned more and had more and more experiences, I actually met a rabbi that got me back to Judaism in a very different form than what mm -hmm. I was raised in, and I'm not um, hiding it and I'm not ever proselytizing it, but I do want to validate to people that I find value in spirituality. Yes. I find a uh, an, and a community of people who can lift each other up and support each other and do social mm -hmm. justice things. And I personally enjoy praying. I personally enjoy mm -hmm. studying Torah. I personally enjoy the holidays and 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 the rituals, even though I am not Orthodox by any stretch. And I will work on Shabbat, which is a big no no. <laughs> for anyone who's Orthodox in Ju Judaism, I'm not. But the point is, I'm just trying to convey to people listening to this, how um, if, you're, if, you've, if you've been called to do this work, and I think you were felt called, I certainly felt called to do this work, um, you have a very, you need to have a humble attitude and a mm. learner's mind because everybody's different and even with all the people I've done from a particular cult, the range of experiences and the range of issues and problems can vary dramatically. And and I talk about you know the pyramid and fringe members and how people can be promoted and demoted, and it's how important it is to track where that person particularly is in. So uh, share your mindset your professional mindset, please. And in, in, you know, when somebody mm -hmm. says, I need help, you know, walk us through your program. And I want to also ask you to talk about your model. And for those of us on video, uh, there's a chart behind you. Okay. Well, um, funny you should ask me that. Um, first of all, I agree with much of what you've said. 
I've tended to be a little <laughs> bit more shy about being about being about discussing my faith simply because there is a certain there's a certain subgroup of people calling themselves Christians who are very aggressive, not merely open but aggressive, and I feel I've got to err on the other side just that little bit. So uh, I I won't hide it because that's a different error of saying, oh, you you've got a secret. You know, no, I'm not keeping a secret. I am a Christian. You know, that's it. You're done. But that's not what the session right. is about. The session's about the client, not about me. And you've touched on something really important there for me. Um, mm -hmm. That I had I had to go through a lot of my own counseling and my own supervision at at various points in order to make sure that the only person who was important in the room with me was not me. And I think that's something that sometimes gets overlooked. We are in such we, we are in such need of people who are counseling ex members that we forget that people counseling need themselves to have dealt with the real issues in their lives. It's not that you deal with it and it's done and dusted, but that you're in control so that if something comes up in a session and it's, it pushes a button in you, you know not to bring that up in session with your client, but you do know to go to your supervisor and say, this came up and I thought it was finished and I, it's not, we need to talk. Um, and I, I get reports mm -hmm. from people mm -hmm. who've been to other counselors who say, well, actually, we spend an awful lot of time talking about their, you know, their problems. And it usually starts very innocently with, oh, yeah, that's like what happened to me. And it turns into more of a sharing session on, a, you know, like we should be sitting here having cups of tea and some biscuits, which I think is just that little bit of an edge too mm -hmm. far. I do think we all have to walk that tightrope, and I think we have to be careful. Yeah. With it. And I, you know, I felt very strongly that this needs to be something that I err on the side of caution with, because once you've stepped over, you can't pull back easily. I suppose technically you can, but it's really tough, mm -hmm. and you've changed the dynamic in the room. So um, I'm glad you brought that up. That's that's important. As for what I do, well. Yeah, and I don't push my. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I don't push at, at all uh, that I'm Jewish. But um, I, I, uh, if somebody asks me a question, mm -hmm. I, I always keep in my head the goal is to empower yeah. them yeah. to think for themselves and make their own decisions, and I always try to frame things in terms of my my mental map of yeah. where they're at. And, and I, I appreciate you saying there are two different distinct things of interventions to get someone to the point of realizing the yeah. guru isn't God, you know, or the prophet is not, you know, in the Bible yeah. cult or whatever, uh, where the person says, I have to exit this because it's unhealthy. And then recovery, like, what do I do now? How mm. do I mend the hurts that I've caused. I mean, for me, I try to recruit everyone in my family and friends very aggressively and did the shock, you know, Satan's going to possess you stuff and you're going to burn in hell stuff yeah. as a Mooney uh, that they, I traumatized my friends and family that when I got out, they should have waited to bring up how traumatized I was because I didn't need to hear it in the first month of getting out how how horrible yeah. I was to them. But you know, they did what they did. But um, and it's it's kind of like peeling an onion or it's going in spirals of growth when you're exiting a group because you have more and more memory. Yeah that come up from the cult, incidents, pieces that didn't make sense. For example, I, I, I fell asleep at the wheel of the van and I called my sister, had a deprogramming, um, and I had asked my parents after the fact, a year ago, were you like, shopping for deprogrammers because the Moonies really stirred me up to not tell my family where I was at all. And they were like, no, later we were, but not then. 
and I and I was able to unwind. Well, why did they move me out of New York as the chief lecturer across the street from the public library to a mobile fundraising mm -hmm. team? And I remembered I had bought a history textbook with my stipend as a leader, thinking I was going to boost my lecture uh, for of the history of restoration yeah. as one of the lectures. And I realized the parallels were wrong. They were historically inaccurate. And I asked about it. And that's when I realized, oh, they lied to me. They, they, they distracted me from that question that would have caused me great dissonance. How can I teach something that isn't factually yeah. true? But it took me a couple of years after getting out to remember that sequence. Um, in any case, no, forgive me okay. for sharing that's more okay. about myself. That's interesting. So can you, can you, so would you say that you've done more Bible-oriented no. cults than no, Buddhist actually, cults or meditation cults or extremists? That's, that's an, ex that's an interesting me. question. When it started out, it tended to be a lot of the different yoga groups, like my, the group I started in was um, Self-Realization Fellowship with Paramahansa Yogananda. Uh, and then I moved on through some other groups, but that doesn't, that's not really important. But oh. a lot of the groups I got were the yoga groups and of course Zen groups and other Buddhist groups. But mm -hmm. the Christian groups tended to be the children of God, church of Bible understanding, a few other groups like that. The Bible speaks, um, some of these more out, you know, outlier groups. Um, World, I know the wall, but of course, the leaders worldwide have died. Church of God, as it was originally, <laughs> uh, and, and so on. So they, they tended to be fairly few groups, and yep. then over the seventies and into the eighties, mm -hmm. yep, over the seventies and eighties, it turned out we started getting more of these um, shepherding groups, and um, the way that sort of crept in. Explain okay. shepherding to it's, our it's, listeners. It's a blatant pyramid structure of authority so you have your, your chief over a shepherd at the top and he's he has the rank of an apostle basically most of them call themselves that some of them didn't doesn't matter but they acted as apostles they were absolute authorities and then everyone underneath them was in some kind of what they called covering to someone above them that led up to the top and you could literally do nothing without the permission of your shepherd whoever he was whether it was the shepherd or the under shepherds. And that structure went into the family itself. So the wife was utterly subject to the husband. The children were utterly subject up through the mother to the father. And because of that, the abuses were rife. You had. And needless to say, you had money being abused. Yeah. You had sexual abuse. You had. Yeah, totally. No, any abuse no you can think of, it becomes possible when somebody says, even if you think you're doing wrong and it hurts your conscience, if I've told you to do it, I am your covering and God will not hold you responsible for whatever I tell you to do, no matter how wrong it is. Once you bring that into the equation, it means that if I'm your covering, I can tell you to, to, you know, to pretty much do anything. And as far as you're concerned, God won't hold you responsible. And covering you from Satan's yeah. invasion, oh, right, Christian? It's covering yeah. you, protecting you from yeah. satanic, demonic yeah. So if invasion. you want a job... And why this particular thing Sorry, is... I was going to say, if you want a job, you're going to ask me, as you're covering, if this is a good job to have. You're going to ask me, should I go to that university and study that subject? You're going to ask me, should I marry this person? Should I buy this house? Should I buy... Is it time for me to buy a car? It's all up to me as your covering. And then I'm answerable above to, to other covers. And that still goes on today. We're seeing that in right. things like the and New the Apostolic. And the guy at the top? We're seeing that in the New Apostolic Reformation, and we're seeing that in these dominion nope. groups. And it, it has, even though the people who started it have tended to say, I repent of this, they've created something they can't control. So... Um, yeah, this is this is needless to say, this is not Judaism or no. Christianity. This is a structure. And my recollection back in the 70s when I got out of the Moonies was in the master plan of evangelism. Mm. Um 
there was a forward that said that the communists brainwash people for Satan. We need to brainwash people yeah. for Jesus. Yeah. That became a kind of a, somebody somewhere <laughs> thought that was clever. But <laughs> you, you know how it is. People yeah. get this idea. Yeah, it's awful yeah. abuse. And now- and in and, and, and the cult of Trump, I talk about the New Apostolic Reformation being the core, like 40 million Americans of that base where the people are following their apostle mm -hmm. or their prophet. Uh, it could be a woman. There's a few women who claim to get direct relations from God, but it, they're following them. And as soon as they say we're not, God doesn't want Trump anymore, then they're on to yeah. whoever they yeah. designate. Period. However, I did an interview with Andre, Andre Gagne and, and right. Fred Clarkson about a schism that's happening in NAR of those people who are still holding to the prophecy that Trump won the 2020 election and those that said, no, you know, we overstretched on mm -hmm. that one. So there's a, 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 a schism happening. Inevitably. I'm, and I want to say to people listening to this before I forget to say it, Cult of Trump, if you haven't read yeah. it yet, read it. Sorry. I, I know you don't want to do an advertisement for yourself, but I, I, I just done it for you. No. Uh, so. Well, don't <laughs> apologize. Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it's really important to understand that Trump is a result of yeah. decades of organized infiltration, deliberate, you know, dismantling of laws to protect the public, consumer mm -hmm. rights, you know, yeah. etc. And there is that an estimated 650 million NAR people in the world. And so the 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 news media is saying, oh, this this popularism happening around the world that are putting dictators in place. And I seriously question if we take out all the NAR people and all of their mm. disciples, just whether they'd have any uh, political power That's at all. That's a good question. I can't wait to see uh, what happens next because this thing is, it's got its own wheels now. It's, it pretty much has its own momentum. Um, but I want to come back to your question. Back in the 70s and yeah. 80s, the primary concern was people Please. with people was Unification Church, Scientology, and the Eastern, the various Eastern meditation type groups. And only then did you see things mm -hmm. to do with Christianity. Now I would say that almost half of the groups that I deal with at any one time are somehow some kind of a divergence from Christian teaching. So, you know, as you're saying, NAR, and you've got the whole Dominion teaching, uh, it just and, and then the, the the prosperity teachers and the way they're all mixing together in some places and not mixing in other places, um, and that's just that's just exploded over the last twenty say twenty or thirty years in particular. I'd say twenty or twenty five really. It's become much more of an issue yep. because people are realizing Christians shouldn't be be doing this. Yep. And so they're starting to ask questions and they're starting to challenge. And the other big growth I've <laughs> and the other big big uh, growth I've seen is in so-called yeah. self-help things and um, you know the, the man management training and self-help psychology and seminars where you go off and you pay silly amounts of money to have somebody tell you what you could have been told by your mom and dad for free. Um, just common sense stuff mixed in with a lot of junk mm. and junk science and junk philosophy and junk psychology all thrown together and made into something which they can sell you because it sounds good. So that's that's the change I've seen over the 50 years. Yeah. Yeah, there's a there, there's and radicalization I would add, yeah. or at least and yes. trafficking are two other areas that I've gotten into in the, especially in the last 10 mm -hmm. years deeply because uh, people are being radicalized by the social media platforms yes. themselves as well as media, especially with the pandemic and being isolated from people. Uh, there's a lot of programming being mm -hmm. done um, with algorithms yeah. even. Yeah. Well, that was another thing that, that took us all by surprise, I think, was the internet and how the internet can become 
a substitute space for going to a meeting with a group, going to a place or to an event. Just go on the internet and nobody even knows you're doing it. Yeah, the flip side is I had I wrote Combating Cult mm. Mind Control in 1988 yeah. when the internet started beginning popularized in the early 90s. Uh, I everything had to change because you didn't you know I used to carry 50 pounds of uh, mimeographed you know uh, yeah. journal articles and and photocopies etc. Things started going mm. online. And then with the introduction of the smartphone, it became impossible, to, you know, to have somebody surprised by their family to please meet with these people so you can demonstrate to us that, you know, you're thinking yeah. for yourself. They were getting tracked. They were getting texts mm -hmm. all the time. So I needed to change my methodology in terms of how to help people get out uh, to this strategic interactive approach where I'm coaching family members and friends and ex-members how to ask questions, how to engage in a respectful yeah. way, um, which is way more time intensive and, 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 and energy and financially intensive and not for everybody. But it also is a much gentler exit it's not going for a snap, it's going for ahas and building a platform of understanding as well as emotional and social support for the person, be f you know, for them to yeah. exit to. Well, you raise an interesting point there because one of the things that I found in the 70s was, as you all know, Ted Patrick and people who imitated him in America became a really big thing. And I found that really disturbing. This, oh, it was never big. It was a few. Well, it became a it became a big thing around where I was. Yeah, it was Ted Patrick never was he, big. No, but he was noisy. Um, he he was ah. he was well recognized, and a lot of parents. Yes, noisy is a, a good word. He, he got a lot of parents to think, well, here's the answer to our problem. We'll just whisk the kid off someplace and make them change their mind. And I found this disturbing. People would come to me and say, well, can we do this? And I'd have to say, number one, it's immoral. So it ain't going to happen. Number two, it's illegal. So it ain't going to happen. Number three, it will harm your child to do that to them. Whatever you think they may do or they may not do. It's, it's exactly, traumatizing. It'll harm them. And you will yeah. be responsible for doing that harm to them. Now, is that really what you want? And... I would have to, to say, you know, we, 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 we'll do this some other way. And that meant I had to come up with another way. Um, and, you know, and, and there was, <laughs> there was all this business in the late seventies and early eighties in particular, by which time I was here. So when it happened after 76 in the States, I'm not sure, but here, late seventies, early eighties, there was a, a trend for, well, invite me over and introduce me to your, your son or your daughter as an old family friend. So let's, let's break that down my way. Mm -hmm. Lie to your child and trick them into talking to, sure. to me and pretend that they don't know you well enough because they grew up in your house to know who your old family friends were. And then we're going to go through this charade and I just happen to know about their mm -hmm. group. And let's see how far we can push this lie before they say, I'm out of here. And so... I had to say to people, no, I'm not doing that either. That's deceptive. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, we're back at it's immoral. And we're also back at it will break the, the trust. Whatever trust is left between you and your child, it'll break it. Because once they catch you in a lie, they're done with you. Because that's what the leader mm -hmm. said you'd do. He said you were dishonest, you're untrustworthy, you're working for the devil, you're working for the psychs. Whatever the group says are the bad people in life, you're one of them now. Once you lie, you're done. As soon as they catch you, it's all over. And so what we worked out instead was something that I've called the mediated dialogue. And this is it, when parents come and say, or family members mm -hmm. come and say, you know, what do I do? I try to bring everyone together in a mediated dialogue. And the focus of it is not to get anyone out of anything, because I don't believe that, that um, 
uh, that agenda, even if it's stated openly, is a good way to start. I think the first thing that I want to do is to give them the chance simply to listen to each other and understand each other and keep listening until they can say, mm -hmm. right, now I know why you mm -hmm. have that position, even though I disagree with it. Because that way we have an open conversation. That way we mm -hmm. have an open relationship. It's not this do or die thing that I kept seeing in the 70s and 80s where it was, we've got to get them out. We have this one chance at them. It's like 24, with that, what was that, that program about the terrorists, 24 was it? And it's always the last minute, we've got to do this or else the world's going to come to an end. Yeah, there was one. And that was, that seemed to be the attitude so many people right. had. And I didn't want that. I wanted to say, first, let's work on the relationship between you and your loved one and make it an open relationship where the conversation can be continued or not continued as you feel you're both ready to talk to each other. Normalize that. And then we talk. So as a form of, of family yes. counseling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, you, the title of your organization is the Dialogue <laughs> Center. What can I so say? So that kind of s states yeah. that obvious yeah. thing. And, and, and I totally agree. The goal for my clients is never to get the person out or to rescue them. It's to empower them to yeah. think for themselves and make their own yeah. decisions. And, um, you know, the, 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 but I, I, I'm different than you because I am more high profile, you know, ex Mooney, mm. you know, whatever, such that if people look me up online, if they're, you know, fanatically in a group, they'll immediately tell their leader, my parents want me to talk to Steve. And then they, they may even cut contact with the family altogether. So I have to stay back and just empower people, have them read my books, do coaching sessions, a prep meeting, and et cetera. But you know, I, I don't think there's one size no. fits all. And there are millions of people who need our expertise. Can I ask you to explain oh, the, yes, your model? And I see your chart to the behind model you for those who can yes, see the video. Okay. What I was trying to do back in right. the early days was to come up with a way of explaining things that didn't use um, volatile, emotive terminology as much as possible. I wanted to, to relate to, uh, to people with words that wouldn't upset them. Because as soon as you say to somebody, well, I think you're in a cult, for example, you're going to get pushback. Um, <clears throat> so there were issues right. with that. And, you know, we don't need to go over that again, totally. but I do, in fact, not use the word cult myself. If other people want to use it, that's okay. It's, you know, it's not a, it, it wasn't handed down to me on tablets of stone. It's just my alternative so that I don't have to talk about uh, a label. I can talk about function. But the second thing that I was looking for to do was to give people a way of understanding what goes on inside someone. And I have a basic principle that I work from, which is that we all tend to do what fits our belief about what reality is and what we are. From the earliest time, as, as infants, we're creating a mental map. So right. we don't live in raw reality. We live in the internal reality of a map we're making. And as we grow, we make that map more and more accurate. And hopefully we, we live, you know, we don't do anything stupid and hurt ourselves. The trouble with that, of course, is that if somebody gets inside your head, metaphorically speaking, they can play with that map. So an authority comes along and persuades you that the Messiah has returned and was born in, was it 1922? Is it, um, you know, if, what's the, uh, yeah. Sun Young Moon was 1920. 20. 20, okay. I, I always get that wrong. It may have been 1918. It, it's either 1918 or 1920. I've only been out 46 <laughs> years. Well, I remember. But. I remember I hearing remember this explained that, at, a, at a carpet meeting back in 1978, I guess it was, 77, being explained at a CARP meeting. And in, yeah, founder of CARP at Queens mm -hmm. College. Well, it, this yeah, was in Manchester. And he was explaining how if you took the various chunks of years in the Old Testament and into the life of Jesus, you could project it forward and predict the date when the Messiah had to be born. 
And the trouble was, of course, his use of That's what I said earlier exactly. in this meeting. And the, the trouble was that the years yeah. didn't actually match up properly if you knew what you were talking about. And um, it just so happened that an assistant right. professor at the university who was versed in ancient history sat in on this one lecture and then proceeded to ask the question, what about this year? What about this year? What about this year? And as he kept asking these questions, more and more people got up and walked out um, because the lecturer w was experiencing some e extreme cognitive dissonance, shall we say, and didn't really have answers for it. <laughs> <laughs> so once, once, go ahead. I have to, Please I do. want to interrupt for one second, if I may, Christian, and just say I was, when I was recruited in program, the lecturer said, and these parallels mm. are true. You can go to the library and open the history textbooks and check it out for yourself. Yep. I did, and they're true. And nobody ever nope. checked it out until I <laughs> went and got a book and was like, no, they lied. Yep. Big yep. lie. Exactly. No, I was, anyway, I was, what I was going to say was that once... Continue. Once somebody who is an authority figure inserts themselves into your idea of reality and begins feeding you changes in what reality is, you, you end up changing your behavior because you change your mental map. And that's what this is about, ways of changing the mental map. So if you got into my head and uh -huh. persuaded me that I can actually fly, why would I ever use a flight of stairs again? Why would I ever climb anything again? I just fly you know i'll <laughs> levitate i'll bounce on my bottom maybe and i'll fly and this is what this is about because mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. systems interact with one another and they're all based on the leader the master the source of all truth um source as l ron hubbard liked to be called and so for example what we see here is that mm -hmm. you can be given an experience and one of the early things that everybody has described to me is that in the early days of recruitment, they had some kind of an experience. Maybe it was in meditation or maybe it was in some other mental uh, change of framework so that they had no, they entered into an altered state of consciousness of some kind. Or maybe they had some kind of realization that was created through the manipulation of ideas. But it brought them to the place where they had this kind of aha mm -hmm. moment where, oh my gosh, this must be true. And from that point on, they're more susceptible because they're trying to fit in with everything. And that brings us to context control and communication. In context control, the way I describe that is that, first of all, you're in group pressure situation. So you're seeing other people modeling the correct behavior. If you want to be a good follower of a leader, you're going to act like them. And they're going to behave in ways, if you step out of line, they're going to behave in ways that say to you, that's not the way we act around here. So you ask the wrong question, and my gosh, they were all looking at me funny. And maybe in the days to come, people don't talk to you, or they only talk about official things when they have to. And your reality testing is restricted. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if, if I go into my church, or I go into my astronomy club, or I go into any group that I'm normally a part of, and they say something, and I say, hmm, that doesn't sound right. I can go, like you say, to the library and look it up. I can really do that. And like I said, gosh, he got that wrong. In this kind of a group, the context control is such that you are either explicitly taught or implicitly suggested to, but you don't check because the leader knows more than everybody else. I, when, I grew up, when I was growing up, I always tell the story of when I was growing up, mm -hmm. a friend of mine, his family was in the Worldwide Church of God. And every few weeks, their leader, their local leader used to come around and ask them very embarrassing, very particular questions about their sex life, for example, and about their money. But he also went through any of their reading material mm. and took it with him if he didn't approve of it. He checked what movies they listened, they, they watched and what stories they listened to on the radio and what TV shows they watched. In fact, he eventually had them get rid of their TV because he considered it an infection. And that meant they only had mm -hmm. restricted reality. And it came from Armstrong and his publications. And that was it. Now, most groups I find restrict where you check your facts. Because if you can check your facts anywhere, you can contradict the leader eventually. 
And this causes you to remodel yourself inwards. Mm -hmm. You change who you are inside because you have to act like that. They're all wearing certain kinds of clothes. They all don't wear brown shoes or bright colored clothes or whatever it is. I better be like them because I want to be part of them because I want more mm -hmm. of that mystical experience, more of that persuasive confirmatory experience. And so that catches you up. You become mm -hmm. trapped in this de deprivation of your environment. Your internal environment changes, your external en environment changes, and you become isolated. So that's the right. first part. And you know, you know how co communication mm -hmm. corruption goes. You know, you, you, you use words in a certain way in a group. So whatever sect you're in, you have your in language. And gosh, I want to join this group. I better learn this language. Right. You know, um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to call people out there raw meat, or I'm going to call them carmies, or I'm going to call them whatever our group says the outsiders are. I'm going to talk about enemies, whatever way the group says. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about friends, whatever way. Um, so the language becomes emotional. It has significance beyond the definition. And that means that my thoughts are controlled. Right. All of this comes from the leader because the leader will wear whatever mask he needs to relate to you. So if he, if you need a good friend, he'll be friendly towards you until he lures you in. If you need a master, he'll be a master. If you need a father figure, what was Sun Myung? He was true father. And this, this, this father idea. Mm -hmm. And this mother idea for women leaders is so pervasive, either explicitly or implicitly. The idea is that these people are more parents to me than my own parents. And the mask keeps being changed according to who he's being towards his followers. But underneath, he's still the same narcissistic abuser because he still wants what he wants, which to me is power. Because if he has power, he can have your money, he can have your sex, he can have your service, he can have your thoughts, he can have your time, he can have everything. And that that combination of those things right. produces a change in who I think I am. My, it, it creates a new mirror, if you like. I look in the mirror and I don't see who my parents think I am or who my friends think I am or my colleagues or, or anybody. I see who the leader says I am. And that means I relate to reality in a new way. So that's how I do that model. That's what it, you know, and by explaining that, it helps people. So, um, I, I, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. So, um, in my experience, Christian, um, there are many groups where the leader has died, but the group ideology and practices yeah. continue without that charismatic, all-powerful mm. person. So I just wanted to add that, that this is not meaning there's a physical living leader uh, necessarily That's in right. every mind control group. Because so, some, some cults are just plain ideological mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and uh, this, this uh, decentralized, uh, uh, you know, resistor model where people are just being indoctrinated online and there's no mm. hierarchy, but instructions are being put out. If you care about Allah, yes. you know, you can decide, use a knife or drive a truck yeah. or Strap you know, a bomb find on. these yeah. chemicals and yeah. make a homemade bomb. Well, this is an right. important point. Exactly. Because, sorry, um, well, all I was going please. to say to that is, it is a problem at first glance, but two things mediate that into the, into the real world. And first is that the leader tends to be in some way semi-divinized. So um, Joseph Smith, although he's not considered source, infallible source in quite the way that, say, L. Ron Hubbard is, he's not considered the Messiah in the way Moon is, but Joseph Smith still has this aura of he gave us the finished work, which means, of course, editing has to be hidden and changes in doctrine, and changes in policy have to be hidden. But the official story is Joseph Smith gave us the official work. He did it all. And now, if you like the reputation or the image, uh, let's say the mask, the mask lives on after the leader dies where that becomes ensconced in an idea mm. 
Well, where I it like becomes it. ensconced in an idea, it's even easier because the the leader stays entirely hidden except to the people he's abusing. And when he dies, the ideas stay intact. So, you know, Rajneesh is gone, but the ideas, mm -hmm. the teachings, mm -hmm. the, the videos and the tape recordings, they're still there for those people who still follow. And they're, he's larger than life in, in that way. Hubbard himself. Miss Cabbage will not admit that he's yeah. changing things. Yeah. He's still clinging on to uh, Hubbard as the proof that he's a faithful Scientologist himself and the master of all he surveys. It's that, it, it's, it's that death mask that goes on as the real leader. And we see this on internet groups as well. The idea... That's so interesting. I yeah. just want to add for yeah. our listeners that Joseph Smith was the head of oh, the yes. Mormons, now the Latter-day Saints. And Rajneesh, after he died, they did a rebrand, and now they call it him Osho, even though he's dead. But there are many you know, people who are at the, the mm. compounds who are out teaching you know, Bhagwan's crap. Um, and uh, horrible hypnotist, yes. I would add, Bhagwan, and sex maniac and drug maniac. In any case, um, please go through your whole model. I'm really enjoying listening to your description. And as you're talking, we're, we're, we're coming at the elephant from a little different yeah. way, but we're yeah. both like well, spot on describing well, the all elephant. all of this together, the point is that if I don't have an emotional response to the ideas, I'm not going to join. Um, we tend to think that human beings are thinking animals that feel. We're actually feeling animals that think in many ways. And so to join something as opposed to just wait. Or rationalize. Yeah, we, have, we have to have an emotional connection. And that's why the experience up here, that's why that's so important. To change my consciousness, to change my my emotional connection is important. And that, that, as you know, can be done in a lot of ways. I can have a meditation experience. The fact that you relax for the first time in your life, maybe, for more than a couple of minutes, gives you a really good feeling. And you think you've, you've made some kind of a breakthrough. Uh, guided meditation will take you places. Uh, NLP can be used to take you places. You mentioned hypnosis. Hypnosis can be used to take you places. You can be given an experience. I had a client that described mm -hmm. how their particular leader, who was really into the psychology side of things, because uh, he was, by his own admission, um, a psychotic. Uh, and he thought that was worth bragging about. Uh, but mm. he, he did something mm. to this woman that caused her to have a severe response. And he said, see, that's ab reaction. That's how much I know about the human mind. And that making that connection, however, you know, whatever you want to say about the reality of it, it made the emotional connection. Gosh, this guy understands my mind so much that I have to just trust him. And that's well, that certainty exactly. Is and very it's emotional powerful. certainty. And it's confirmed by a, a an, an experience that says, I have now not just heard the commercial for water. I've had a drink of the water. And that's what's proven to me. I've had my perceptions mm -hmm. changed. I've mm -hmm. had my worldview uh, tinkered with. Somebody has poked me in the worldview and made me start thinking maybe what I think I know, I don't know. This guy knows more than I do. This woman knows more than I do. And that gets you here, not here. And then, you, as you say, you rationalize. Oh, well, he said mm -hmm. these things. He showed me these things. No, he touched you here with an experience that made you say, I don't know what I think I know. Mm -hmm. And th to me, the important thing about this is that it's non-coercive. We've talked for decades about how the groups will use coercive methods of persuasion, and they do, no question, but they also use this non-coercive persuasion. If I hold a gun to your head and tell you to do something, coercive persuasion, You'll do it because you don't want me to put a bullet in your head. If I put an idea to your head and you accept that idea as reality, you'll do it all by yourself. No coercion necessary. And that's what makes recovery from a group like this so difficult for people. They deal with the coercion. 
they deal with the bullying, they deal with the abuse, they change their minds about things, but they don't realize that they have been coerced into changing how they see the world in themselves. And so they get stuck in certain points. Mm -hmm. And if we can deal with that, that other level of persuasion and help them to see, you were taught to see the world as it is not. So you've tried to live in the world as you are not. And if we can get there, that's, if you like, that final step out for many people. Does that make sense? So Christian, I want to, yes, absolutely. Going back mm. to your model. So it's, it sounded like you start with a family mediated the dialogue family and then hopefully the person in the cult, if the family comes to you. So talk a little bit more detailed, uh, you know, for mental health professionals, right. for example, who are wanting right. to learn about this. What are the key things? And did you explain everything on your model pretty that much, you wanted to? Pretty much. Make I sure mean, to go, th go through that. The, the, the thing with this model is that depending on the group, depending on the individual, it goes in all sorts of different directions. Uh, people need sometimes to know more about the masks because they think the leader is being so sincere. Oh, but he lives such a poor, austere life. Oh, but she's a celibate and she never eats either. And sometimes you have to unpack some of that and help people to say, well, you know, this is a mask. Yeah, they don't <laughs> breathe. Or, <laughs> they don't. I now, love this, that this one. This is a mask. And, and or, you, you know, we need to look beyond it. And we need to see that this has been debunked. Uh, Sai Baba didn't really materialize things. Sai Baba had a plate, a metal plate buried in the ground. So when you stepped on it and he touched you, he completed a circuit and you felt the shock. You know, that kind of thing. You have sometimes to unpack this. And that doesn't come all at once. Very yeah, often. Yeah, magic yeah, trick. Very often this has to be explained mm -hmm. in stages over a period of weeks even. And that's okay. But people... Mm -hmm. People benefit from being able to see, I, at least in my experience, they benefit from being able to see that there's a rational explanation for what happened to them. There are ways of, of exerting leverage, if you like, on a person's choices. And that's what this is about. So to come to your, mm -hmm. to your other question, if, mm -hmm. if the, the member themselves comes to me, and this does happen, I'll get a call because somehow people have decided that it's okay to ask me questions and talk about things with me in a non-committal way. And that's okay. I, you know, I, I'm open door about that. And I've had some very useful conversations that way. And I've learned a lot, but I've also been able to help some people that way. Uh, I, I, used to, I had somebody call me once every few months and ask me questions and they forgot what name they used. They didn't use their own name. They forgot what name they used, but they always ask the same kinds of things. And eventually they came to say, I've been calling you for months now. And it was because I just wanted to know whether I should leave my group or not. Um, it wasn't really for my friend, it was for me. And then we were able to have a constructive conversation about what they were doing, what they'd been looking for. So if a family comes, what I do first is I get them mm -hmm. to learn to listen. Parents and children have generations of experience at in a certain point of time laying down the law you know if it, it no son of mine is going to do this <laughs> no daughter of mine is going to get away with that and the so-called children on the other hand no they're not children they're 23 years old you know <laughs> come on um but when you when it's your parents your parents always think of you as their child so that's the way it is but when their children are doing something they're mm -hmm. saying I'm grown up now. You, you can't rule my life forever. I think this is important. And at a certain point, that turns into not listening to each other. I believe that if the parents or the family mm -hmm. member begin the process of demonstrating listening and hearing and really understanding what they're hearing, even if they don't like it, and separating those two things, I can listen to you without agreeing with you and liking it. I can listen to you and disagree and still respect mm -hmm. what you've said. Mm -hmm. I, so I first try to teach the parents to do that. So we go through a lot of practice of, of listening. And then we talk mm -hmm. about, That's then we great. talk about what happened to your, your loved one. And then we talk about, 
How do we repair the damage that has happened between you and them in the early days when you felt that you had to take a stand and say, you know, if you do this, you're no son of mine or whatever. How do we tear up these ultimata and start mm -hmm. talking about, you know, you're my, you're my child, you're my family member. And that's more important to me than this. It's more important to me than Scientology. That you're my child. Yeah, and, and apologizing works it, too. It if works it's brilliantly. Sincere. But by the time I've gotten people to the stage <laughs> of talking about this, they usually realize, "Ooh, I made a mistake," and they'll say, "Oh, I'm so sorry I did that." And I'll say, "Have you ever told your loved one how sorry you are?" Start there. Start with you've now had a realization yourself that you've mm. done something you're sorry for. You wish you hadn't done. Say that right. to them. Say, "Look, we got off on the wrong foot here." I, I screwed up and I am really sorry and reinforce that they are important to you. So I, I actually do try to bring them to the place where they see different. And things. it's that emotional exactly. connection. And right. That it's, it's that emotional connection. Are you familiar with Celeste Headley's work I've, on listening? Um, it's, it's on my to-do list of things to, to, to get in touch with back in night. Go ahead. She's really good. She did a TED uh -huh. talk. She has a book that I highly recommend okay. to my clients. But I was going go to say on, back in the early 80s, I came across a really interesting woman named Rachel Penny, another mental health professional, who put together this short thing called creative listening. It's based on what we all learn from so many different directions about how to listen properly. But she made it highly passive because she made it as a means of reconciliation. So she didn't make it essentially as a way to start a conversation, but simply as to start a listener. And I, I spent some time with her. I learned from her. And then I said, look, I have a reason why I want to do this. And I told her what I, I wanted it for. And she said, well, by all means, use it because I think this will help. So I have been using... A ver it's a very simple model. It's a model that anybody right. can learn in the space of about a half an hour. And that's why I use it because it's all about learning to hear, learning to reassure the person you hear by giving them your own summary of what they're saying to you. It's, you know, it's, it's standard. It's what everybody does, but she's packaged it in a way that's mm -hmm. really easy. Yeah. It's yeah, mirroring And it's back. really easy to learn. And you, it's great. I'd love for our okay. blog. I've, I've got, I've got her booklet that, here. You know, link to that. Rachel piece. is long dead now, unfortunately, but the, okay. her booklet lives Great. on, and I would be happy for you to see it. Um, but by doing right. that, and her work yes. lives on. Before yeah. we wrap, no, I was oh, going I'm to sorry, say by ahead. using that, it brings the parents to the ability to realize that they weren't listening before, which they usually weren't because they were worried. And when we worry, we stop noticing things, including we stop li listening. When they do that, they realize, gosh, we, we need mm. to restart. And that's when I say, talk to the kid again if they'll, you know, if they'll listen to you. Start with your apology. And at some point, just say, I would like to start again with you. And I would really like for you to tell me what this is all about. And mean it. If you don't mean it, don't do it. Don't waste your Yeah, teach me how to communicate yes, with exactly. you. It's you know. So much of what we all do, we are all mm -hmm. doing the same thing in slightly different ways with slightly different emphases. But we are getting there because we're realizing that these parents need mm. to need to, to pull back the the, the 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 kind of authoritarian structured. I've raised you from a baby. I wiped your bottom and fed you. I know you better than you know yourself. Pull back and start again. You've got a grown up here. Help them. Right. And then from there, you know, we just continue. Right. But there's, and then there are siblings and yes. there are friends who notice yes. the radicalization that will be more effective yes. in the beginning, I found, with building that rapport and yes. trust back and later get yeah. to the parents if, in fact, there was that kind of authoritarian uh, influence. Okay. We're running out of time, but I really want to ask you to talk about. Uh, the differences in your uh, clinical experience with people born into cults and people who, like myself, were recruited mm. at age 19. 
Um, yeah. Any any first uh, observations first is the you obvious want to share? One. The obvious one is that if you've been recruited, you have an outside reality to connect to. You have an alternative to this internal reality control. If you're born in, you don't have that. Or even if you were recruited because your parents joined when you were six, so you were kind of raised in it. It's really difficult to say what's what's normal. Once I leave this, where do I leave to? And in clinical terms, that means yeah. doing, and this, this is a whole other program that we don't have time for, I realize, but that means going to what I call my recovery map. I have a kind of uh, a mapped out route of going through a series of processes where I enable people to reconsider what their worldview is, what beliefs they want to keep, what beliefs actually fit with the world around them when they come out. And it gets quite detailed at times. So it goes, it gets to the point where I've taken people, taken grown people out to a park and put them on a swing so they could have the experience of playing. They'd never played in their lives. It's a traumatic experience for some. I would never ask mm. them to do it alone. I have to take them because they get on a swing and they sit there and then they start rocking because how can you sit on a swing and not rock? And suddenly they realize they're enjoying that feeling and they may become nauseous. They may become you know, very anxious. I've seen people start to shake and sweat just from sitting on a swing because in their group, Anything pleasurable was a waste of God's time or a waste of Krishna's time or a waste of whatever's time. And now they're doing this deeply terrible right. thing and they feel bad. And now we have to talk about this experience of having fun. So it, it's a, it's quite a detailed program that I work through with people and it's custom made. So, so two things. Hmm? So two things. One is, would you consent to a second interview where we can go over that <laughs> <Of> map? <course. laughs> uh, and secondly, I, you're you're making a very important point that I realized too decades ago, which is um, sitting in an office with that population and not going out with them. And and yeah. and being a support, like especially with phobias, yes. if they're phobic of something from yes. the cult, whether it's an elevator or dogs or whatever, to model that it's safe. Let me show you. Exactly. You know, the dog is licking exactly. me. It's not biting yeah. my hand off, right? It's 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 and it, but it's not doesn't fit the normal clinical model of sitting for an hour oh, in an you, office. <laughs> But you need to go to where the people are. I'm so are glad at. to hear somebody else say that because I have on occasion shared this with professionals who have said, "You mean you go to their houses? Yes, if they invite me. Yes, I do. I meet people in their houses. I meet people in cafes. I meet people in parks. It's more difficult now because with perverts stalking parks, adults going into a park is is a dodgy thing. Mm. But I still find ways to take people." into mm. environments that their group mm. would normally not have allowed them to enjoy. It's necessary. And yes, sitting in an office doesn't often scratch that itch. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that because it, it sometimes gets yeah. a pushback. And another thing that I realized, Christian, is that for really profoundly difficult mm -hmm. cases, complicated mm -hmm. cases, I need to do what I call an intensive which is six to seven hours a day. Uh, and the model I use is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, mm -hmm. Friday, with mm -hmm. Wednesday off to digest and integrate, um, where I just put all my attention with this person and have them walk me through the moment that they heard of the group mm -hmm. all the way through. And then when we have that psychoeducation about brainwashing and mind control and other cults. Then we go back and do family yeah. of origin yeah. stuff after that. But I give them a toolbox and actual experiences where they feel yeah. like I can do this and, and, and have techniques for how to, in a sense, exit counsel their yes. younger self. You know, but and I ask them to think if I knew then what I know now, what would I do differently or what would I say differently? And it's, I would never have gone or I would have told them to drop dead, you know. And 
that visualization, it doesn't change the person's memory of what actually happened, but psychologically they're taking back their yes. power. And they're moving into the present. Um, of, of being in their yeah. body. And they're moving themselves into their they're present. being in the here and now, which, exactly. Which works really well with trauma. They, because the trauma is back then and you'll never forget it. If it scarred you, you don't lose your scars, but you have grown past it and you can only see you've grown past it when you're looking backwards and saying, that was then and this is now. But when what you said before about time intensives, yeah. you, my, my heart is singing inside me because somewhere around 1984, 85, something like that, I gave up on the 50 minute hour. I completely threw it out because my fundamental principle, one of my fundamental principles in this is that the way a leader devalues his members is by taking their time for his own purposes and never giving his time unless it's to get something from them. So a member is devalued in terms of their mm. sense of time. A, ma a member comes out and with that idea that I'm not worth anything unless I'm performing. It's almost, and I've had people actually say this to me, I don't have the right to exist unless I'm doing what I'm told. And so what I chose to do right back in the beginning or near the beginning was to design the way I use time so that my time belongs to them on an open, on a more open scale. Because that's a way of saying the fundamental measure of your value is your time. And I value you as a client to the point where I will give you whatever time you need. We'll take breaks in between because you need to get away and digest and have a rest. But if you want a two hour session, I'll do a two hour session with you. If I've had right. people do five hour sessions, we take breaks in there because that's, that's too much to ask anyone to do. They need to get away and they need to come back and say, yeah, I'm done now. If that's what they feel. Or they need to come back and say, I need to do this before we stop. Right. But it's got to be theirs. Now they're in control. Now the time is given to them as a currency. Here's what you are worth, whatever you need. If somebody says, I want a 15 minute session, they get a 15 minute session because time for me is the major currency here. And so to hear you say what you've said, yes, yeah, sometimes people need more time. And I've had people sit for 45 minutes saying nothing before they finally say, I'm ready to talk now. Great, great. You're in charge of this. This is your time. You, it, and I'm giving you whatever you need. And that turns the dynamic around. So I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if that's relevant to what you're saying there, but it, it's certainly something that resonates when you said what you did. Hi, Dr. Stephen Hassan here. Um, we had some technical problems with Christian Zerko's um, recording. Unfortunately, there was an outage, electrical outage, and we had a technology issue where his video didn't record, so I apologize. We're gonna try to figure things out and do another episode uh, for the podcast, for the blog, about his recovery model. So I'm very grateful to him for all the decades of, of work that he's done to help people a gently exit. And um, I wanna invite people to, uh, to stay tuned and subscribe. Thanks. Take care. Bye.